Although it's not uncommon for pilots to witness UFOs, the case of Japan Airlines Flight 1628 is remarkable for involving a prolonged and dramatic close encounter corroborated by multiple radar systems. The witness's story attracted both media and government interest, and the resulting investigation unearthed a wealth of supporting evidence, including extensive radar data and radio transcripts that document official handling of the situation. The case is a standout example of an airline UFO encounter, and it tells us a lot about the ways in which the FAA, the airlines, and even the US intelligence community work behind the scenes to manage what we hear about UFOs. On November 17, 1986, Japan Airlines Flight 1628, or JAL 1628, a Boeing 747 cargo plane, was carrying French wine to Tokyo by flying westward over northern Canada, with a planned stop in Anchorage, Alaska. The pilot was Captain Kenju Tarauchi, an ex-fighter pilot with more than 10,000 hours of flying experience. With him were co-pilot Takanori Temafuji and flight engineer Yoshio Tsukuba. The crew entered Alaskan airspace shortly after 5 p.m. local time, and the Anchorage Air Traffic Control Center ordered them to fly in the direction of Telkitna Airport, north of the city. As the crew began their turn, they immediately noticed a light in the direction they were headed. Once they'd completed the turn, they saw multiple lights at 11 o'clock at an estimated altitude of 35,000 feet, or 10,600 meters, just below their plane. The lights were moving at about 660 miles per hour, or 900 kilometers per hour, in the exact same direction as the plane, so that they appeared to be standing still from inside the cockpit. Tamafuji, the co-pilot, radioed Anchorage Center to ask if there were any aircraft in the area, and the controllers confirmed that theirs was the only craft on radar. However, flight engineer Yoshio Tsukuba saw an irregular return on his own radar screen that he described as a stream. The only clouds were some thin and spotty ones around a nearby mountain. Tarauchi noticed that the two lights began maneuvers unlike any ordinary aircraft, which he likened to two bear cubs playing with each other. Tarauchi grabbed his camera and tried to take a picture. With autofocus on, the lens wouldn't stop adjusting. On manual focus, the shutter wouldn't close. Roughly 7 to 10 minutes after first noticing the lights, two UFOs, or spaceships as Tarauchi called them, appeared in front of his aircraft, first one above the other, then side by side. From the crew's perspective, the UFOs were square, but Tarauchi believed that they were actually cylindrical in shape, seen from the side. He could see that a wide vertical stripe down the center of each craft was see-through, and sometimes ejected a stream of lights that Tarauchi likened to the sparks from a charcoal fire that spewed from side to side. Tarauchi estimated each object's size to be close to that of the fuselage of a DC-8 airliner. Each of the objects had a rectangular array of what Tarauchi called exhaust pipes, or ports, around their circumference. All of the ports were lit up with white light and rounded at the corners like the windows of a passenger plane. They all seemed to shift position as a group, or rotate around the cylinders. For the next three to seven seconds, these ports shot a fiery light that Tarauchi compared to the exhaust from a jet engine. The exhaust would flare up and down from different ports at different times, in a way that seemed to be controlled automatically. Tsukuba stated that the light of the exhaust was either white or amber colored, though Terauchi thought that it had turned other colors too. The light from the objects lit up the cockpit of JAL 1628, and Terauchi could feel the warmth on his face. Tarauchi described the two UFOs as moving as if they shared a common center of gravity, while oscillating slightly with a random wavering motion. Tarauchi's notes on his drawings suggest that each object rotated back and forth on its own axis, while the lights moved around the cylinder. Tsukuba described the UFOs as undulating. Tsukuba later stated that he saw the target appear on radar immediately after the visual sighting. Radar operators at Elmendorf Regional Operational Control Center 
also reported a target ahead of the plane. At this point, the UFOs were flying at the same speed as JAL 1628, although they were higher in altitude. The UFOs remained in formation for three to five minutes before they shifted into a line at 40 degrees to the plane's left. During the 10 to 15 minutes that the UFOs were either in front of or to the left of the plane, the flight crew had a very hard time communicating with the ground below. The UFOs then flew away, and the equipment worked as normal. The crew found no abnormalities in the aircraft to account for the malfunctions. Around 15 minutes after the first UFOs appeared, the crew spotted a pale white horizontally elongated light at the same altitude, direction, and speed as their own plane, coming from the direction that the first two UFOs flew away. The crew asked Anchorage Center if there was a light at their 11 o'clock position, but there was nothing on ground radar. Tarauchi set the aircraft's digital weather radar distance to 20 miles, and a large round object appeared on the screen about 7 to 8 miles, or 11 to 13 kilometers away, in the same place that he could see the light. At one point, Anchorage had a radar hit about 5 to 8 miles, or 8 to 13 kilometers away from 1628. Anchorage then radioed Elmendorf Air Force Base, where their controller reported that for a minute to a minute and a half, he too picked up a weak return about 8 miles, or 13 kilometers from 1628. While Tarauchi was speaking with Anchorage, the light gradually repositioned to the left of their aircraft, revealing that there were two of them, before disappearing off the radar scope. Tarauchi said that he felt that this maneuver was performed as if the UFOs understood their conversation. The lights were now located just below the eastern horizon, where it was most difficult to see them, at an estimated distance of 7 to 8 miles, or 11 to 13 kilometers. Tamafuji said that he could not see them due to his position on the right side of the cockpit. As they were flying over Fairbanks, the crew looked behind them and saw the silhouette of a walnut-shaped object with a lip around the middle and the two pale flat lights on the outer tips. The top was lit by silverish lights that flashed in a sparse, irregular pattern. Tarauchi later estimated it to be about 1.5 to 2 times the length of an aircraft carrier, and referred to it as a gigantic spaceship, or as the mothership. Tsukuba later said that this object appeared very vague to him and was difficult to see from his position. The crew requested a right turn change of course from Anchorage. Once they realized that the mothership UFO had followed them on this turn, they requested a second change of course, but the controller ordered that they continue the turn through to a full 360 degrees. As Tarauchi executed this maneuver, an Anchorage radar operator observed a primary target in the 6 o'clock position, about 5 miles, or 8 kilometers away from JAL 1628. Elmendorf Control Center's radar also displayed a target behind the aircraft that followed it through the turn. When the crew completed the full 360 degrees, the gigantic UFO was still observed to their rear. Tamafuji later insisted that there was no possibility of weather interference on the radar screens. The UFO followed the plane towards Talkeetna. A United Airlines passenger aircraft was entering the same air zone, and Anchorage Center requested they get visual confirmation on JAL 1628. When the planes were in sight of each other, they both flashed their landing lights, but by this time, Tarauchi claimed that the UFO had suddenly disappeared. Tarauchi places the end of the encounter about 75 miles, or 120 kilometers north of Talkeetna. He landed the plane at Anchorage International Airport at 6.20 p.m., and estimated that the whole series of UFO sightings lasted about 50 minutes. Shortly after landing, the crew was interviewed by a security manager with the Federal Aviation Administration, or FAA. Jim Derry, who determined that they had seen something following their plane. Derry specifically asked if there were any cockpit lights reflecting on the inside of the windshield. Both Terauchi and Tsukuba confirmed that there were none, because the cockpit lights were off. 
Taruchi began speaking to the press about his encounter in December 1986, and was shortly after grounded by Japan Airlines. He then spent several years at a desk job before being reinstated as a pilot. Some have speculated that this was punishment for going public, but Japan Airlines claimed that it was part of a routine rotation. At some point, Taruchi stopped talking about the events, and directed the airline to respond to inquiries by stating that he stood by his account and didn't want to repeat it again. Still, the case went public after a Japanese news correspondent questioned the FAA about the incident on December 24th, sparking interest from other media and forcing a government response. FAA Public Affairs Officer Paul Stuck stated that only one of the three radars returned a blip, and only briefly. Stuck also claimed that a review of the radar tapes found no evidence of UFOs, and he denied that there was any agency investigation. He also said that he called the Air Force and was told that their radar signal was only clutter and that there was no military investigation either. Stuck spoke to the media again on January 6th to claim that the FAA reviewed the radar data and found no recording of a giant object. By early January 87, the sighting was getting a lot of media attention, so the Anchorage FAA began making their documents, data, and recordings available to the public. The planning documents that they released revealed that around January 4th, the agency re-interviewed the flight crew, reviewed data tapes, and obtained specialist reviews. Around this time in early January 87, John Callahan, six-year division chief of the Accidents, Evaluations, and Investigations Division of the FAA in Washington, received a call from the Air Traffic Quality Control Branch in the FAA's Alaskan Regional Office. The branch asked Callahan how they could respond to the flood of calls from reporters to make them go away. Callahan instructed his caller to tell reporters that the matter was under investigation, then requested all the available information and data be sent to the FAA Tech Center in Atlantic City, New Jersey. Callahan went to the FAA Tech Center with his boss, where engineers used a computer program to synchronize all of the flight data, voice recordings, and radar together. Callahan then asked FAA specialists to plot the radar targets on a chart, then videotaped this chart, along with the voice and radar playback. The video was shown to FAA Administrator, Admiral Donald D. Engen, who set up a briefing for Reagan's scientific staff in an apparent attempt to offload responsibility for the case. At this briefing, Callahan presented the evidence to members of the CIA, Reagan's scientific team, and a few other unidentified individuals. Callahan claimed that someone from the CIA closed the meeting by saying, this event never happened, we were never here. The official then confiscated all of the data and swore everyone in the room to secrecy. Callahan suggested that they tell the public about the encounter, but said that the idea was rejected on the basis that it would cause panic. A few weeks later, the FAA delivered its report on the event, as well as the chart and videotapes, to Callahan. Callahan said that he expected someone from the CIA to come pick them up, but no one ever did. The final FAA report was released on March 5th. It concluded only that the radar returns had been the result of an uncorrelated primary and beacon target that somehow coincided with the maneuvers reported by the flight crew. In an Inquirer article from May 1987, Alaska's air traffic manager, Hank Elias, said that his honest answer to inquiries about the incident was that the FAA could neither confirm nor deny that the anomalous radar return was due to a split beacon where two adjacent targets appear from the same aircraft. He said that the erratic behavior of the radar returns wasn't unheard of, but it wasn't usual either. 
On January 11, 1987, less than two months after his first encounter, Tarauchi was piloting another 747 north of Anchorage, Alaska, when he reported a group of unusual irregular pulsating lights in front of his aircraft that seemed to be anchored to a large black object. The lights passed below the aircraft's nose before disappearing behind the craft. A similar encounter occurred later in the flight. However, during a later interview with the FAA, Tarauchi said that he felt that both sets of unusual lights that night were just village lights distorted by ice crystals in the atmosphere. The FAA agreed. All three of the controllers that engaged with the crew during the sightings filed statements that contradicted the findings of the FAA. Anchorage Control Center staff reports revealed that several times they had primary returns where the crew reported UFOs, but they did not specify exactly when and where. Another air traffic controller at Anchorage Center later wrote that he watched a signal on his radar that behaved in accordance with the descriptions given by the pilot. He also claimed that other radars confirmed that they too saw returns in the same locations. As public interest in the Japan Airlines sightings peaked in January 87, the popular UFO debunker, Philip Klass, tried to dampen it. In a press release from January 22nd, Klass suggested that the crew had seen nothing but an unusually bright image of the planet Jupiter, and possibly Mars. Klass also claimed that the radar blip was just a spurious echo from the mountains below. Klass's explanation got a lot of traction in the media, contributing to the public perception that the entire incident had been explained. With the release of all the supporting materials in March, Klass revised his explanation for the Summer 87 issue of the Skeptical Inquirer, adding that the nearly full moon could have caused moonlight to reflect off of turbulent clouds of ice crystals and appeared to Tarauchi as afterburners. Naval scientist and amateur ufologist Bruce Maccabee produced a report on the JAL 1628 UFO, which appeared in the March-April 87 issue of the International UFO Reporter. His report details that the large walnut UFO appeared nearly opposite to the planets from the crew's perspective, casting doubt on Klaas's explanation. Tarauchi said himself that he recognized Jupiter during the flight and insisted that whatever he witnessed was not a planet. Though Tarauchi claimed that he was not afraid, he and the crew were unsettled by the fact that they did not know the purpose of the UFO, as he put it. Tarauchi did not venture a guess as to the origin or intentions of the UFOs, and has apparently not spoken publicly of the event since the immediate aftermath. Callahan retired in August of 1988, and in response, the FAA branch manager sent him all the agency's documents on the case. Though Callahan was asked not to talk about it, he felt that the public had the right to know. From 2001 onward, Callahan began to speak out about his involvement in the case, and to push the US government to reveal what it knows about the UFO phenomenon. He spoke at a UFO disclosure press conference in 2007, as well as the citizens' hearing on disclosure in 2013, and has made several appearances in UFO documentaries. He also wrote a chapter on the case for Leslie Kane's popular 2010 book, UFOs, Generals, Pilots, and Government Officials Go on the Record. Shortly after this, Callahan spoke to the Huffington Post, admitting that in his final 10 years working for the US government, he lied to the public and helped disseminate disinformation on UFOs. John Greenwald runs the Black Vault, a website specializing in U.S. Freedom of Information Act, or FOIA, requests for documents on UFOs. He first filed an FOIA request for the JAL case in 2001, and was alerted to the existence of 107 pages of documentation. However, he was informed that all of these documents would soon be destroyed. Upon making a second request in 2009, he was told that the records were already gone. However, in 2018, Greenwald found around 1,500 pages of documents related to the case in the National Archives. Most were letters from the public, but there were also copies of news coverage, FAA communications, radar data printouts, and interviews with the crew. 
Japan Airlines Flight 1628 was not the first or only commercial flight to encounter a UFO, but crews rarely report their sightings for fear of professional consequences. The fact that Terauchi was put on desk duty for years after his report may help to explain why most pilots generally don't talk about UFOs. Whatever the reason, Callahan's investigation with the FAA proved that flight crews, flight controllers, and radar operators do obtain evidence of UFO activity. The FAA paper trail and the wealth of technical data makes JAL 1628 one of the best documented UFO cases on record, and the involvement of the CIA proves that the US government was more invested in the case than they were letting on. As Callahan put it, Who are you going to believe? Your lying eyes or the government? YouTube's been suppressing our videos for a while now, and there's no guarantee that our channel won't be demonetized or deplatformed altogether. Supporting us on Patreon, PayPal, or Buy Me a Coffee is the best way to help us counter censorship. Think Anomalous is created by Jason Charbonneau. Music by Josh Chamberlain.